Hello and welcome. I am Momita Chatterjee. I am from West Bengal State University. In this module, I am going to discuss about some of the basic aspects of programming in R. Actually, this module is a part of the modules which are based on recapitulation of basic R. In some of the previous modules, we had already discussed about some basic tricks and techniques of programming in R. So, this module may be considered as a continuation of those modules. In our discussion, we will primarily concentrate on three of the different aspects of programming in R. In this module, we will show you some of the basic aspects of programming styles like indenting a program, making a program as generic as possible and so on. So, let's concentrate on the discussion. So, let's start with the basic question which is why do we need to program? Many a times in the midst of handling our data, you will often find that the basic functions that R provides us are insufficient for our purpose and you need something more. In that case, you can always define your own function which is also known as user defined function by writing a program. Now, if you want to do the same thing but with a magnifying effect, that is if you want to create a library with a series of functions, then programming is always required. Another aspect is that in most of the cases, we don't actually have a handful of data to validate our proposed model. In those cases, simulation studies really help. Even if we do have a data set, simulation studies always needs to be executed to validate our model more precisely. And for a simulation study, when you need to repeat a program again and again, then several programming techniques are always there to minimize your effort as well as to minimize the time required. So, by now, we have got the answer of the question, why do we go for programming? Now, let's see how actually programming in R works. Here, the problem is to find the distribution of the median of Cauchy distribution. So, consider the sample program. We all know that mean of the Cauchy distribution does not exist. So, median is used as a measure of central tendency. So, here, what do we do? We are simulating 10,000 samples each of size 10. Next, we are calculating the median for each of the 10,000 samples. Now, look at the histogram. This will give us the distribution of the sample mean. Now, here comes the idea of making the program as generic as possible. See this program. Here, the objective is to get the mean of 200 simulated samples each of size 20. This program looks good and serves your purpose. But, if you see this program after 6 months or a year, you find yourself lost within the program. You might not understand what the sample size and simulation size is. But, if you look at the following program, you may observe that here we have specified the sample size and simulation size separately. So, just with the minimum effort, we can always understand everything about the program even after a substantial amount of time. Next, have a look at the two codes. As you can see, they are actually the same. Just by indenting the first one, we have the second. The second one is nicer looking and using this, we can avoid a lot of errors. Usually, we indent a program keeping into mind their order of execution. Here, in this program, at first, we are starting the I loop 
and then assigning null values to the ith row of sample dot mean. Next, by introducing the jth loop, we are actually assigning what the jth column of sample dot mean contains. Now, since all the steps are not being executed together, so it would not be justified to start them from the same distance of the margin. So, this is basically the idea of indenting. Next, look at this program. The indent which we just talked about is proper here, but still it lacks something. What is it? Just looking at the program once, will you be able to understand what is happening here? Probably not. It will require some time to understand. Actually, the program is valid but not user friendly. So, instead of this, look at the next one. Here, if you use simulation size instead of m, sample mean instead of x, and sample size instead of n, it would be easier for those who are using your program. Moreover, it would also help you to understand your program at one go even after a gap of a substantial time. Another aspect of programming style is the use of matrices. This will help you to run your program much faster. For example, look at the two codes. These two are giving the same results and the same logic is being used. For the first one, we are using two loops where for each i, r is considering different values of j and then the values of i and j are added and the result is stored in a. We are doing this for different i's as well, but this whole thing is making the program a bit slow. Instead of this, just consider the second one where a matrix is built with the elements of i and j and then by adding each of the element of the matrix with the element of its transpose, we have the desired result. Indeed, this requires much lesser times. The first one requires nearly 3 seconds and the second one requires 0.08 seconds. And obviously, the time difference will be more if we increase the number of elements. So, the take home message is that you need to find the trick of replacing loops with matrices. Now here comes one of the most useful aspects of the programming style. You can always add comments with a hash sign. This would help you to understand the objective behind writing this code which is indeed very important. But the thing is that Comments should be written properly and in such a way that it would be easy to understand. The interesting part is that you can really add whatever you wish to because R is not going to execute anything which is added after the hash sign. Like in this program, we have added comments starting from the specification of the simulation size, sample size, the number of repetitions and the calculation of sample mean. But keep it in mind that overusing this programming style may turn the program to look a bit clumsy. Like here, when we are starting the i and j loops, we are not commenting on because it is something anybody can understand easily at a glance. Here, we are showing the structure of the r loops. Usually, we come across four kinds of loops namely for, while, if and if else. Let's consider them one by one. In case of for loop, we specify the range of the indices within the first bracket after the word for and then by optionally using a second bracket, we can always write down the R code. Now suppose we are asked to write down a code which will work if certain thing holds. Then what to do? The quick solution is use the while loop. 
since this is a logical one so we need to specify the logical statement within the first bracket written after the word while then again by using an optional second bracket we can specify the r code the next one is if loop it serves nearly the similar kind of purpose and the structure is almost the same for both the loops the if else loop is an improvisation of the if loop with the else part providing the r code which is applicable when the logical condition does not hold now suppose after starting the program suddenly you realize that it falls in an infinite loop or suppose you detect some error in your program and your program is still running so you know that either it will not give any answer or the result that it will give will be erroneous so if you continue running this it would just be a wastage of time then what to do the simple thing that you can do is just to type the command stop or break this will stop the loop from further execution now let us consider an example to illustrate what we have learned till now suppose we are asked to write down a program that will compare the power of the two sample t test with that of the wilcoxon and kolmogorov's mean of test when the underlying data are normal here we know that the two sample t test is a parametric one and the two mentioned letter are the non parametric competitors of it now why the question of normality because we all know that t test can't be done when the underlying distribution is non normal so at first what we do is we will open an r script we'll name it example and save the script in the r home directory we all know this procedure very well now for our own convenience it is good to add the purpose of the program and the date of modification here the purpose is to simulate the power of the two sample t test versus various non parametric alternatives and the date of modification is 1st june 2015 following what we have learned previously the hash signs are added here since we know that r is not going to execute that part of the line which is starting with the hash sign so we are putting the purpose and the date of modification of the program after the hash sign next we are going to specify the sample size and the number of simulations to run with here the simulation size is 200 and the sample size is 10 now for simulation at first we need to specify the means of the two samples for this we are setting the first population mean to be 0 and run the simulation for a range of values of the difference in means here delta is taken to be the difference between the two sample means and it takes a sequence of 50 values between minus 2 and 2 now we all know that the random numbers which are produces are not actually random instead they are some pseudo random numbers so if we set the seed we can actually produce the random numbers which we are looking for here we are setting the seed to be 231 but it can be any number so the structure of our program will look like this here we are getting different values of the mean of the second population by taking different values of delta then with these two sets of means we are varying i from 1 to the simulation size which is 200 here and we are doing the following three things which are firstly the generation of the ith sample then performing the ith set of tests 
and finally checking if the test rejects the null hypothesis of equality. Then we will calculate the simulated power. So our program will now get this look. The first things are the same as that of the previous one. Here within the loop j, the means for the second sample are generated. Now since we have 50 deltas, so the mu 2s are also of size 50 and the things within the ith loop are already specified. So now for the jth setting, we are calculating the power of the test. Since we have 50 sets of mu1 and mu2, so altogether we have 50 powers. So let us now define the variable name which will hold the simulated powers. Here at first we are initializing the variables pow.ttest, pow.wtest and pow.kstest which will store the powers of the three respective tests and then we are calculating the powers for each of the 50 combinations of means. We had already discussed about the calculation within the jth loop in details. Here comes the things which are happening within the ith loop. At first the two samples are generated. Then for each of the 200 simulations, the t-test, Wilcoxon test and the Kolmogorov Smirnov tests are performed and then the powers are calculated. So by this way we can compare the three tests elegantly. So through this discussion we are aware of some of the new aspects of programming in R. Now we are stopping here and we are stopping the discussion based on basic R that is the recapitulatory discussion and from the next module onwards we will start discussing different advanced programming topics like metaprogramming, object-oriented programming and functional programming.